to be presenting a lot of information. It's really just the tip of the iceberg on this uh, project that I've been carrying on. And I put uh, the entire kind of in-progress document out on a Dropbox site. I don't think anybody wants to copy that long link down, but if you send me an email <laughs> at the email address, which is pretty manageable, I will send you that link and it'll, it'll make life much easier if, you, if you're interested in further detail on what I'm going to describe this morning. Okay, so without further ado, uh, we, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Uh, we must hold global warming to 1.5 degrees C to avoid what would otherwise be catastrophic environmental consequences. And so we can plot this two ways. We can say, yeah, we've got to get global warming down to 1.5 C from where it otherwise might be at 4.3. Or actually, it turns out to be useful for what I'm going to be showing you to also plot the same information in terms of by how much do we have to reduce global warming. So essentially the same information, we have to reduce global warming by 2.8 C to get to where we want to be, but down here in what I'm loosely calling the needed operating window. Now, there's a constraint on what we as a world uh, can do, at least in the near term. As, as probably all uh, well, you know, in 2015, most of the countries of the world got together in Paris and agreed on what are called the intended nationally determined contributions to mitigating global warming, mainly how much CO2 emissions did the countries of the world agree that they were going to cut out uh, in that agreement. Basically, they agreed to reduce their CO2 contributions from fossil fuels by 56%. And so that adds another constraint to what we're trying to do. We not only need to uh, be down here, global warming-wise, but it would be a really good thing to operate within the constraints that the nations of the world agreed to. So this kind of defines what I'm calling the necessary operating window. And uh, I think most of you know this, uh, so kind of the bad news is if all the world does is hold to the INDC emission pledges, and just getting a hold of that is going to be hard enough, but if that's all that, uh, that we do, uh, global warming will reach 3 degrees C, roughly. And that, that would not be a good thing. So we still have work to do. A little bit more precisely, we can uh, answer the question, well, what if we uh, achieved 100% uh, reduction in CO2 emissions? What would that do for global warming? And the answer from the, the most recent information I've been able to find is if we cut out all the CO2 emissions, global warming would reach about 1.5 C. Um, and that would, that would be pretty good. And so now let me move on to the technologies that we might use in trying to achieve those objectives. Uh, of course, you know, you've seen many, many lists. Uh, many technologies have been proposed for mitigating global warming. Uh, the easy ones, and the, the obvious one, the first, is conservation, reduce energy needs, and use recycling. And there's no question, just do it. Uh, and it, and uh, uh, so I'll show you in a minute that uh, Mark Jacobson has actually calculated that a fair amount of what we need to do can be achieved by those means. But then we move on into the category of alternative energy generation over here. Uh, nuclear will, will play a role. You heard that from uh, Dr. Stephen Chu last night. Uh, it ought to play a role. Um, I think a fair statement is it can't be expanded a huge amount beyond <coughs> what it's going to play, uh, and probably that's uh, limited by the post-Fukushima uh, mind, mindset of the world. And, you know, maybe for good reasons. I don't know. We'll have a whole discussion about that ourselves. Uh, another alternative energy source, uh, geothermal, yes, good thing, but it only has limited sites. Hydroelectric, yes, good, but again, limited sites. Uh, fusion, not quite yet. Uh, I understand it will be here in 20 years and always will be here in 20 years. <laughs> that's, that's what most people tend to say about fusion. Um, I'm skipping over wind and solar for a minute. So then we, aside from alternative energy generation, we move into a more uh, aggressive, you might say, the means of mitigating global warming, uh, sometimes called climate engineering, geoengineering, well, just climate engineering. Uh, and one uh, prominent uh, item in that category is the carbon dioxide removal. You're going to be hearing from uh, Peter Pukowski in a lot more detail about that after, after I'm finished. And uh, I think Peter has said, Peter, tell me if you violently disagree, but I think we're in agreement that yes, it, it, CDR is possible, but even if it's implemented, it'll probably be too slow to avoid catastrophic global warming. We need something, something else. And then down at the bottom of the list in the climate engineering is uh, big bad solar radiation management. It's been, been much discussed. 
uh, much examined, uh, and uh, I, just to kind of dig out what I think is a fairly objective uh, assessment of solar radiation management, I found a report by the Aerospace Corporation, which is a pretty knowledgeable and generally objective outfit, and in their report they uh, listed 15 cons and 5 pros. So I think, uh, I'm not misstating the facts, uh, the world is kind of saying, don't go there on solar, solar uh, radiation management. So that leaves us, at least among the well-known technologies, with, uh, with wind and solar. And so what can we do with, with wind and solar? Well, the, uh, as I say, Mark Jacobson's group at Stanford has uh, been doing a lot to try to figure out what we can do with wind and solar. And so what they have done is they've done a very, uh, very fine computer modeling studies of saying if wind and solar were used to supply 100% of the energy needs of the world, uh, how much storage and interconnection do you need in order to have reliable electric supplies, you know, given that the wind stops blowing once in a while and the sun goes down roughly once a day? Uh, something is needed if you're going to use wind and solar for all of your energy. And you, you've heard a little about that from uh, Stephen Chu last night and from others. And so they did come up with a plan of how much storage and interconnection would be required to have more or less a workable system. And uh, here's the output of their work. A uh, rather interesting number that comes out of the report. Total upfront capital cost, $124.7 trillion. So uh, I've also spent a little time at Stanford, uh, as, you, as you heard. And I gotta say, that, you know, even at Stanford, I think $125 trillion is a lot of money. <laughs> so, so looking at that, that same solution again for a minute though, 100% uh, wind, wave, and solar, I've, I've commented on the cost. Uh, it put this over here. It, it, in order to get global warming down to uh, 1.5 degrees C with 100% wind, wave, and solar, uh, you need to be well beyond the commitments on the CO2 reductions that the world uh, committed to in uh, December of uh, 2015. So that's a problem. Okay, so what's, what's the world going to do? Well, maybe there's, maybe there's another approach, maybe there's another idea here, and that's what I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, during this talk this morning. And as, uh, as Jennifer mentioned, this involves uh, OCHEC that I, I had quite a bit of experience at while I was at Lockheed Martin, so let me just explain uh, what OCHEC is. It's a, it's a well-known technology for generating clean energy using natural vertical temperature differences in the ocean. It's, it's really very simple. Uh, you use the difference between the temperature warm water at the surface, typically 21 degrees C, at least in the, the warm parts of the world, and the temperature of the oceans down at 1,000 meters deep below the thermocline, where it's typically 4 degrees C. And it's very simple. You, you suck in a lot of warm seawater, you pass it through a heat exchanger, and then in most concepts for the OTEC cycle, they're using ammonia as the working fluid. It doesn't have to be, but it's probably the most common that has been designed with. So you use the energy from the warm surface seawater, of course, that, that's really solar energy, that's why the water's warm. Uh, you can boil the ammonia, you can generate enough pressure to spin a turbine, the turbine turns a generator, and that's where your green energy comes from. Now you've got a whole lot of low pressure ammonia vapor coming out of the turbine, and we have to make that, have to condense it back into liquid ammonia so we can have a closed cycle just like any other thermal power plant. That's where the cold water comes in. So all you need to do is build this little pipe, thousand meters long, and, uh, and by the way, 10 meters in diameter for a 100 megawatt OTEC plant. That, that was my assignment of the lucky <laughs> figuring that little guy out. But you, you suck up a lot of cold water uh, through the cold water pipe, you pass it through a second heat exchanger, that's called a denser, a condenser, and you condense the ammonia vapor back to liquid ammonia and you pump it up to the required pressure. And that, that's, that's how OTEC works. And it's, as I say, a very familiar idea. And uh, in 1979, Lockheed and some other companies got together uh, and built, uh, they called it Mini OTEC. So it was the world's first floating OTEC plant that actually did generate net power. The, the question that that answered is would you spend more energy pumping the cold water up than you would get out in electricity? And the answer is like, well, was no, you can actually get, get the net power. I think they generated about 50 kilowatts gross and got about 25 kilowatts net out of that. The, since that time, margins are somewhat better. But basically, prove, prove that it works. 
And also since that time, there have been other experimental low-tech plants that have been built. There's one that actually you can go visit. It's on the big, uh, on the big island in uh, Hawaii. And kind of based on the evolving knowledge about OTEC, various uh, companies in the world have been designing large OTEC plants. And here are two that are uh, pilot plant size, uh, designed to be anchored near shore and supply electricity to uh, the grid. In the uh, location of the close to one by Lockheed, one by DCNS, which is sort of the Lockheed of France. And aside from uh, OTEC plants being anchored near shore and just generating electricity, um, other people have asked, well, what, you know, how else can we use OTEC? And so for quite a while, the concept has been out there uh, called grazing OTEC plants. If you want to use OTEC to uh, an even bigger extent uh, than you can by anchoring near shore, what else can you do? So the, the concept of grazing OTEC plants uh, is that they're not anchored. They're free-floating in the ocean uh, in the tropical regions where the temperature gradient is big enough. And then the idea is you use the electrical energy that the OTEC plant is generating to synthesize ammonia as the energy carrier. A lot of people figure uh, a lot safer to use ammonia rather than just try to generate hydrogen and then carry that in ships and pipelines and so forth. So as I said, it can be safely transported. Uh, and ammonia is an energy carrier. It can then be used as a storable CO2-free liquid fuel. So then this. I didn't have anything to do with inventing any of this and just drawing on some, some known technology. Okay, so here's, here's where yours truly gets involved. It has recently been discovered that the cold water upwelling from a stable 7 terawatts of OTEC can directly decrease the Earth's surface air temperature, SAT, by 1.1 C. That's what's new here. And that discovery is the enabler of this approach. So let me just uh, walk you through that a little bit. What, what's that all about? All right, so I, I told you about OTEC. And not too long ago, uh, Professor Niehaus at the University of Hawaii and some of his colleagues asked the very sensible question, how many of these OTEC plants could you put out there in the ocean before they would totally screw up the temperature gradients that are the driving force for, for OTEC? And they did a very, very nice uh, computer modeling study using the MIT you know, the Global Circulation Model. And here's uh, the results that they came up with. They showed, well, if you put a whole lot of OPEC plants out there, like 60 terawatts, you will get 60 terawatts out on day one. But starting at day one, you're going to start to both cool the uh, surface down and warm up the water uh, under the thermocline. And so now the output of the plant is going to go down, and after a while, you're Definitely they're not going to have your 60 terawatts. What they found by studying it parametrically is that if you limited your ambition to a mere 7 terawatts, and I'll remind you right now the world is using about 15 terawatts of energy in all forms. So 7 terawatts is a lot of energy out there in the ocean though. But if you limit it to 7 terawatts, what will happen is the surface temperature will change by about 1 degree C the deep water, it will cool down, the deep water temperature will warm up by about 1 degree C. You're still left with uh, about 15 degrees C temperature gradient instead of 17. And then the important point is it will stay stable forever. And first, the, the reason it will stay stable forever is the cold water is not a finite resource that they're just sucking up and throwing away. The cold water is constantly regenerated in the Arctic and Antarctic regions. And there's a whole flow of cold water around the Earth. It's called the thermohaline circulation. And so that's why you can generate, at least according to the computer models, seven terawatts per hour. Okay, so another piece of the puzzle, totally independent of what I just showed you, is uh, a little a little while ago I was kind of poking into the literature on what would the upwelling of all that cold water do from an environmental point of view. And I came across a piece of work that I hadn't been aware of before. Uh, it was done by uh, the Keller Group in, uh, in Germany. At Geomar in, in Kiel, they have a climatological research institute. And uh, Keller and colleagues used uh, one of these big, complicated, sophisticated Earth system models that climatologists use these days to predict what's going to happen. And uh, the one they used is probably one of the best known and probably one of the best models, the UVIC model that was developed at the University of Victoria in Canada. And they were studying climate engineering uh, in general. Um, 
But one of the modes of climate engineering that they decided to study was artificial ocean upwelling. So without a whole lot of background on why they thought they might be able to do that, they asked the question, what happens if over most of the oceans in the world we upwell cold water from that same thousand meter depth at an average rate of one centimeter per day? And what they were really looking for was a CO2 sequestration because the cold water, aside from the cold, is full of nutrients. And when you bring it up to the surface, it'll uh, feed the phytoplankton, cause a whole lot of primary production on the surface, which sucks CO2 out of the atmosphere. And that's, that's what they were looking for. And what they, they did get a certain amount of CO2 sequestration, both in the ocean and on land. But uh, another result they got, which was a bit of a surprise, is that same process decreased the average surface atmosphere of temperature over the whole Earth by 1.08 degrees C. And when I saw that, I said, hmm. <laughs> and so a little light bulb went on in my head. Uh, I said, OK, Niehaus is saying we can deploy OTEC at 7 terawatts and we'll be OK. And Keller et al. is saying one centimeter per day upwelling will decrease the air temperature by 1.08 C. And I said, I wonder how the two quantities of upwelled cold water compare against each other. And I didn't have the foggiest idea what the comparison ought to be. But I said, OK, well, let's just see what happens. And it wasn't too hard to crank out the answer. Well, the answer is that the two quantities of cold water upwelling are almost exactly the same number. So that means the same amount of cold water upwelling that they will produce the same decrease in surface atmosphere temperature. And that is why I say it's recently been discovered that <laughs> cold water upwelling from 7 terawatts of OTEC can decrease the surface air temperature of the Earth by 1.1 C. And that'd be nice to be able to use that in part of our bag of tricks in, the, in mitigating global warming. OK, so now let me come back to the, the plot that I've been uh, slowly and deviously building up in front of you. So here's, here's what OTEC can do. Okay. Uh, if you combine the uh, 1.08 degrees C direct reduction in air temperature Rotec, with the 0.62 degree decrease in air temperature, that's the equivalent of, associated with the amount of CO2 that the OTEC would, would keep out of the atmosphere by replacing that much burning of fossil fuels, OTEC by itself can bring global warming down by about 1.7 degrees C. Okay. Not bad, but not good enough. Way over here, 100% wind wave and solar can decrease uh, global warming down to 1.5 degrees C, but way beyond the INDCs. Okay? And I'll bet some of you can probably guess where I'm going on the next slide. Okay? What if we start out with OTEC at its maximum deployment, or max OTEC, and then add additional wind wave and solar to get us to where we want to be in terms of total mitigation of global warming? calling that the WOWS solution, wind, OTEC, wave, and solar. Okay, give me feedback later on whether you like that. But, well, it turns out that if you say, what does it take to just hold global warming to 1.5 degrees C with this approach, the solution point turns out to be remarkably close to the INDC agreement. Okay? So the WOWS 1.5 solution combining max OTEC and 39% wind wave and solar. That means we're replacing 39% of the fossil energy that would otherwise be needed in the year 2100. This is all for the year 2100, by the way. Uh, it holds global warming to 1.5 C and stays close to the INDC commitments. And because it, especially because it stays close to the INDC commitments, and I guess I would also say because it's using fairly well understood, te understood technology, we really don't have to invent anything brand new here, I claim it's a practical way to hold global warming to 1.5 C. Now, there's no reason why we have to stop at 1.5 C. That's just associated with the INDC commitments. We can continue right on down the WOWS line. Uh, and if we then add 78% wind, wave, and solar to 22% that's coming from OTEC, we can end up at 0.4 degrees C global warming. And that'd, be, you know, that'd be pretty nice. That's better than, than we're at now. Okay. Now, a few of you, I'll bet, are saying, great, I'm going to put 22,000 or OTEC plants or 20,000 OTEC plants in the ocean. What's that going to do to the ocean environment? Anybody been asking that? 
Any questions? Yeah. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Okay, so it's I'll be a really a really important uh, element of uh, studying this and examining this. Book. So I've gone through the literature uh, on the, the possible environmental effects of OTEC. And this is just a one-page summary, and believe me, there's, there's a lot more that backs this up. Uh, here's a list of the possible behaviors. Here's the possible effects. There's one uh, kind of a really important one that I'm actually encouraged about, uh, and that's the question people have been asking for a long time, is will the upwell nutrients set off any harmful algal blooms? Well, it turns out that if you do it near shore, that's a real problem. And, and I found this out by uh, talking in some detail with the, uh, the, the biological oceanography people at UC Santa Cruz, uh, in particular, Raphael Cabela and uh, brought on some information from Kevin Bruin. It turns out that harmful algal blooms near shore form because there are little bits of iron in the seawater near shore, and and uh, the organisms that form the, the most common harmful algorithms need trace amounts of iron in order to grow. But if you go out in the open ocean, as, as I've talked about, it turns out that the iron concentrations in the open ocean are too low to form harmful algorithms. That's, that's a nice little piece of the puzzle, uh, perhaps falling into place. Okay, now another kind of important question, money. Major economic elements. Uh, there's a whole lot more that goes on here, and, and I encourage you to go, go find my, my presentation, and you can look at the details, but just at the real headline levels, uh, I've calculated the levelized cost of electricity for, at scale, for OTEC, compared it against Mark Jacobson's number on wind, wave, and solar, and it turns out they're almost the same number, and, that, and that's without any incentive. So that, that's good. I mean, if, if OTEC was ten times as expensive as wind, wave, and solar, you know, Stop talking about it, but it's certainly in contention. Uh, but then we get a question of, well, can we use incentives? Are there incentives that can help lower the cost of OTEC even further? And uh, for that, we can exploit the capability of the OTEC approach, as I just showed you, to reduce the surface atmosphere of the Earth. So we start with carbon fee and dividend. Anybody here needs to know what carbon fee and dividend is? <laughs> All right. And uh, we could extend that uh, conceptually to include a negative carbon fee. And I think we heard a little about that yesterday, possibly, a negative carbon fee associated with taking CO2 out of the air. Uh, so the, the concept uh, seems uh, you know, not, not too weird. And so the concept would, uh, with the negative carbon fee is to reward CO2-free energy technologies that also directly lower the Earth's surface atmospheric temperatures. There's no reason why it has to be limited to OTEC. You know, anybody who comes up with any concept that lowers the uh, Earth's temperature uh, would be entitled to collect this uh, negative carbon fee. And it's not too hard to actually calculate uh, what the equivalent is in terms of reducing temperature, what that's equivalent to in terms of the amount of CO2 being kept out of the air. Um, it turns out, and, and I've done this in my uh, financial modeling, if I use CCL's proposed rates, $10 a ton at first, going up to $10 per ton per year after that, and say, how much would uh, this approach be entitled to collect under this scheme? And if I then say, okay, we're only going to collect 15% of what it's entitled to collect, uh, that it cuts the levelized cost of energy for this approach to be half of wind, wave, and solar electricity cost. And it also cuts the required investment in half. That's, that's always a nice thing if you're trying to get somebody to go into the business uh, of doing this. So I think it could make this approach very competitive economically. And kind of my dream world uh, is to develop this to the point where it would be known and fleshed out and, uh, such that, let's say, a large oil and gas company would like to take it on as an adjacent strategic CO2-free fuel liquid fuels business. So that's part of, part of the dream. And there are some other uh, potential benefits uh, of this approach, and uh, Brian von Herzen uh, reminds me of these, and this is from his work. Uh, coral reef cooling, uh, a one degree C decrease in the surface temperature would help the coral reefs a whole lot. Uh, and then there's another contribution in the area of marine permaculture or aquaculture. Uh, a lot of people have been studying and, and know that if you upwell nutrients from below uh, the thermocline, bring them up to the surface, uh, that can be the basis of uh, essentially open ocean fish farms. 
Uh, the problem is how do you open up the cold water and what kind of platforms do you use to attach the fish farms to? Well, if OTEC very nicely is uh, almost for free, well, free in terms of the agriculture, upwelling all the cold water, and it's providing big platforms on the ocean to attach the fish farms to, it, 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 may, be, it may be very synergistic. They uh, help uh, feed into the possibility of marine permaculture. So I'll wrap up with uh, a couple of quick conclusions. Uh, again, I'll remind you, if you really want the full details, uh, just send me an email, uh, and I'll send you back the link. Also, if, if a few just <coughs> can't even wait for that, um, I've got a, a one-page, kind of very informal brochure summarizing some of these key points. I didn't want to you know, cut down half the trees in the world and just hand it out, so I've got about 10 copies with me, but if somebody really has a burning interest, ask me, and I'll give you a copy of the brochure. So the, the headline conclusions, uh, are that max OTEC plus 39% wind wave and solar can hold global warming to 1.5 C, uh, can also generate, I, I, didn't, I didn't explain this before, but I'll need to remind you, we're generating seven terawatts of electrical energy out on the ocean. Okay? By the time you convert that into ammonia, you lose some, and then by the time you burn the ammonia in a thermal power plant, for example, although there are lots of other ways to use ammonia as a fuel, you have another loss. So your 7 terawatts on the OTEC turns into 2.6 terawatts on land. But it's on land, it's wherever you want it. It is dispatchable power that's really important to the electric utility. If you turn it up, turn it down, 24-7, 365. So it's a very useful kind of CO2-free energy. Uh, it keeps the required fossil fuel replacement close to the IMDC commitments. Uh, the requirements for storage and interconnects are reduced considerably at 39% uh, replacement. The uh, wind, wave, and solar is a whole lot easier to use than at 100% replacement. Uh, max OTEC plus 78% wind, wave, and solar can hold global warming to 0.4 degrees C. Uh, the levelized cost of energy to scale is similar to 100% wind, wave, and solar. The SAT reduction enables incentives such as a negative carbon fee and collecting only 15% of what I've calculated that would be entitled to uh, cuts the uh, energy cost and required investment capital in half. And that's about as far as I've taken it. Okay. Next step, uh, we can get down to 0.4C. If we add to that carbon dioxide removal, and Peter's going to tell us about carbon dioxide removal, uh, I'll be an optimist. I think Peter's an optimist. Uh, if that's feasible and it's added to what I said, we could hold global warming to zero degrees C. Wouldn't that be nice? Okay, so uh, there's a discussion. Am I about out of time? Okay, so there's an interesting discussion, but I think in the interest of time, uh, let's skip over the discussion and turn the floor over to Peter. achieve that this section is top is entitled uh, getting where we want getting the future that we want okay my, we have our slides up so let's get started so uh, um, those of you who don't know me I'm Peter Fikowski I've been with CIS since climate lobby since about the beginning and in fact, I was a member of Results, which is the organization that Citizens Climate Lobby was modeled after for 30 years. And I got the privilege of training Marshall Saunders in the lobbying kind of work that we do here. Uh, when I, the, the reason I got very involved with Citizens Climate Lobby was that um, I was watching Mark and Marshall work on, on their work here, and I asked Mark one day, What's the, what's the end goal that we're trying to achieve in Citizens Climate Lobby? He said, Peter, that's easy. That we're, we're trying to get a price on carbon. I said, that's great, Mark, but that's a means to an end. What's the end? And Mark thought for about five seconds and said, well, Peter, uh, that's your job now. Did, uh, anyone, <laughs> anyone who knows Mark knows that if you have a good idea, it becomes your job. And actually, um, given my background, that was a job I was very pleased to take on. Mark told me we've got uh, Jim Hansen on our board, and you can ask him. 
So at the next conference, I sat next to Jim Hansen at lunch, and I asked this very simple question, well, Jim, what is the end result that we're trying to achieve on the climate? We've been working on it for 30, 40 years now. And there was silence for a, a, quite a few seconds. And he says, well, maybe we can get to 350 by the end of the century. I don't think so. I, I don't think Congress will move, do what we need to do. At which point I stopped eating it, because that was not a project I wanted to be involved in. Um, maybe we can do something, but I don't even know what, and I don't know by when, and this is the world's expert. But I, I, I took hope. I thought maybe he had had a bad day, and so I spoke. I'm an MIT graduate, um, and so I have you know, easy access just by <laughs> who I am to talk to MIT professors, Stanford, Harvard, Columbia. Every one of the climate experts I spoke to had almost verbatim the same answer as Mark, as Jim Hansen. Said, so, well, maybe we could get to 350, maybe not. In fact, th those of you who were here last night heard uh, uh, Steve Chu, and you can see that he was sort of saying the same thing. Maybe we can survive, but I don't know. Well, you can tell that the story is not going in that direction, so <laughs> don't get too discouraged. Um, you know, it, with great thanks to, to Mark and the kind of background we have, you know, my working in uh, poverty work for 30 years and seeing mir miraculous things happen, um, there was another approach. Now, how many of you have done projects? I've been project managers or project training. Okay, actually, it's most of you. So you've uh, almost certainly been taught that if you want a successful project, you need to have a specific measurable result and a specific date. And if it's not measurable or not specific or not a date, kiss it goodbye, it's very unlikely to happen. And then another thing is, it's got to be a result that you want. <laughs> so a specific measurable result with a specific date that you want. And so um, I spent two years uh, with, with uh, Mark's blessing, just sort of traveling the world, asking climate scientists, what do we want? And I finally gave up and I said, okay, I'm going to tell you. What we want is a healthy climate for our children and our grandchildren. And I, at first I said 2100, and my kids looked at me like I was crazy. I said 2070, Mark, Mark, uh, Mark uh, Reynolds looked at me and said, can we do 2050? I said, sure, we can do 2050. Now, again, you project managers know that you know, your boss says, here's the project, and then you figure out how do we achieve the project. Well, you know, you get really different answers if you ask that. Because here's the, the, the thing is that, you know, it's sort of like if you want to go on vacation, um, you could say, you know, I want to, let's you tell your spouse, I want, let's go to Hawaii. Let's go to Hawaii over Easter. Boom. Okay, you figure out, you know, uh, hotels and airline tickets and so on. And it works. Like, a lot of us have been to Hawaii on vacation successfully. Now, the scientific method is very different. The scientific method is, well, um, how far could we go? So, you know, you know, can we get out like uh, 30 miles to Hawaii? Yeah, I think so. Okay, good. Well, let's go out like, 30 miles to Hawaii and then see if we can get the next 2,000 miles. <laughs> and, and, and that's how we've been doing climate. <laughs> and, 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 you know, uh, it was, I woke up at 3 o'clock this morning after our little discussion last night with uh, Stephen Chu, and I just thought, who was I to ask to argue with a Nobel laureate about uh, carbon dioxide removal? And someone said, well, you're someone who studied it, and Stephen Chu, uh, he's an energy person, now he's actually a micro, a nanoparticle person, and carbon dioxide removal is not, his, not what he's doing. And so, um, you, you probably read that, so I'm not going to say much more about myself. Well, I will say a little bit. So I'm a physicist, uh, 27 patents. The thing is, if, if you get to know me, you'll find that I usually will say things that you probably have never heard before. And so, when I'm, you know, just expect that. And if you have questions, I'll be here, and we can talk more later. Um, did I go the wrong way? Okay, so um, a, a few months ago I ran into Bill McKibben and um, 
And I asked him the question I've, I've been asking a lot of people. And it's equivalent to the Hawaii question. The, the question I ask is, are we more likely to give our children a healthy climate if we set a goal of zero degrees warming? And, and Bill, and, and now who, who knows who Bill McKibben is? Okay, good, almost everyone. He, he's the founder of 350.org, and of course the goal of 350.org is to get back 350 parts per million. And if you're not familiar with what that is because you're new to the climate, don't worry about it. Um, that's not the critical point here. So, uh, well, well, actually, it, it is. The, the three, well, sorry. <laughs> So, so, uh, so Bill McKibben, he, he turned white and he said, Peter, the goal of 350 is to give our children a healthy climate. That's what we wanted. And he, he's, a, I believe, an English, English professor. And he said, I went to the scientists and they told me to set a goal of 350. And you know, I could see this face, like, why did they tell me that? Because you know, those of us who have studied the climate and, listened, and read uh, Jim Hansen's papers and all the other papers, 350 is where the cliff is. But uh, if you go to a scientist and they say, you know, tell me about what goal for the climate, they can say, the, the scientists, and they've said this verbatim to me, they say, listen, I'm a scientist, I can't tell you what to do. But I can tell you this, that if you let the atmosphere get beyond 350 parts per million, we're going over the cliff. Now, the, the, the question Bill was asking was, where do we want to be? But, and the scientists will, simply won't answer that, and we'll talk more about that in a couple of minutes. So the point is that really what we want is a healthy climate. Um, last week, the, the Climate Leadership Council, uh, the, the, we, we've been talking about them a lot this last week, and they talked about their uh, carbon fee and dividend plan, their carbon dividend plan. In their press conference, they, they said this, that they started the conference out, and they said, there's a widespread agreement among many, and perhaps most Republicans, that we want a healthy climate for our children and our grandchildren. And I think, that, I think they could say Americans, but they were trying to address the conservative uh, world. The point is that really the goal we want is that Hawaii, that healthy climate for our children and our grandchildren. And that healthy climate looks like the, kind of the climate that our parents gave us. And you can get scientific and you can ask, you know, is it a tenth of a degree above that or a tenth of a, de of a degree below that? But we, you know, that's, the point is we want a healthy climate for our children. Uh, a lot of you, a lot of you have seen this graph, before, or this graph. This is the IPCC temperature change over time. This is just 100 years, so it goes from um, eight, from 1950 to 2050, and of course now is sort of in the middle. Uh, actually, this is about a year and a half old. Uh, things are much worse than they were right now. And now we're about 1.1 1 .1 or 1.2 degrees already. Um, the thing to notice is. You know, we've been saying, okay, if we can get 100 miles out, can we go the next 2,000 miles out? And we've been working on this gap right here. And so if, if we eliminate emissions right now, by the time a lot of the climate stabilizes, you know, we're talking about a, a, a fraction of what's needed. What we want, of course, to give our children a healthy climate is to give them back the same temperature that our parents gave us. And What's interesting is, you know, just like going to Hawaii, if, you, if you're in a rowboat and you say, okay, I can row a mile, can I row 3,000 miles? You say, um, if, you know, maybe if I go fishing and all we'll dance around it. If you say, wait, wait, I want to go to Hawaii. Well, someone says, well, go to United and buy a friggin' ticket. <laughs> well, it, it turns out that, and Alan, thank you so much for your setup for this. Is, I couldn't have asked for more. Um, uh, Alan pointed out that this gap was about, what do you say, $125 trillion of, of wind, water, and solar. Now, it turns out um, that, that this gap, using just current generation carbon dioxide removal, is about half that, is about that much or half. And so, again, the, the, it's the difference of saying, where do you want to go, and how did we get there? So, um, the IPCC t talks and says that we need to have carbon dioxide removal. As scientists, they say, well, let's see what's the minimum we can get away with, and that would be the minimum to get to two degrees. And actually, I don't know what numbers they've used for that, but obviously it's a lot less carbon dioxide removal than we need to get to where we want to be. 
Um, so, uh, the, earlier this year I had a, a request from someone in Congress to generate language for a climate bill, for a democratic climate bill. And they said, we want to put carbon dioxide removal in. What language should we use? And I used this as an excuse to talk to all the scientists in the world who are working on carbon dioxide removal, about six of them. <laughs> um, and said, so, well, what would it take to scale your technology to what's needed? And you know, for the technical people, that's about 50 gigatons a year. If we do 50 gigatons a year, then we're guaranteed to get back to that zero degrees warming, to get back to 300 parts per million in somewhere between 20 and 50 years. Right? There's a lot of uncertainties, but everyone agrees that 50 gigatons, and, and uh, Klaus Lackner at, at ASU said the same thing. He started with 40 gigatons. So I asked, what would it take to get there? And uh, as I said, uh, said, about six of them said, yeah, this technology uh, can, can scale to 50 gigatons a year, and uh, Alan is one of the technologies on that list. Um, any one of them can get to that point. Um, Peter Eisenberger has Global Thermostat, which is across the Bay at Menlo Park, and a couple of us visited there. Um, so, whoops. Uh, so, so th this is their, their pilot plant. It does oh, a thousand ton a year or so of carbon dioxide removal. Um, this is Peter Eisenberger. Peter Eisenberger is a professor at Columbia. He founded the, um, uh, well, actually, I guess uh, Stephen Chu said he worked for, for uh, Eisenberger way back in the 80s at, 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 at Exxon. And Eisenberger also founded the Earth Institute. So Jim Hansen worked for Peter Eisenberger as well. So this, this is not just a, your little guy thinking about things. This is someone with uh, the best credentials. Um, he's holding up a little little cube of a hex, a hexagonal uh, material, which uh, I picked up and I realized this is real. This actually works. And the technology is quite simple. I'm not going to go into the details of it because I'm out of time. Uh, but it's real, and so. But just the, CO2? Yeah, it, 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 yeah, it, it absorbs CO two. It's it's a it's a, a, a honeycomb, and it absorbs CO two at room temperature. You warm it up a little bit, and then it emits it into a CO two pipe, and then you can bury that into a basalt rock field that gets absorbed it, within a few months to a year, into it turns into limestone. So you, you know, if you want to visualize that technique, you can imagine these maybe 10 mile di diameter farms with, with those machines, and then it just pipes the CO2, concentrated CO2 down, turns into, the, it adds to water, can, makes carbonic acid, it combines with the rock, and now you have a lot of limestone. And you can actually scale it to get all trillion tons out of the atmosphere with maybe 10 of those farms distributed in the best places to get solar power that you want in solar power, or wind power. So, the, the, I'm not advertising Alan's technique or Peter's technique. The point is that we've got, um, uh, this is Peter Eisenberger's, this is uh, Professor uh, David Keith at Harvard. He has a, a carbon engineering doing similar stuff, different technology in Vancouver. Uh, uh, Klaus Lackner, uh, who Stephen Chu mentioned at Arizona State. Um, ocean alkalinization, um, there's a uh, whole different technology. Ocean iron fertilization has been controversial, but it's very interesting, very simple, uh, very cheap. Um, OTEC, Alan Miller's, uh, Brian von Herzen, von Herzen has marine permaculture. He's here. Brian, stand up so people can, in the all way in the back, tall guy, just if you have questions. So, so you know, just, it, it's useful to notice, and again, this is an acknowledgement of Mark and Mark uh, Reynolds and uh, uh, Marshall. Gee, two of these people are uh, here today. <laughs> Something about uh, Citizens Climate Lobby and, and uh, Silicon Valley. Um, so the point is we have lots of, lots of options in what's needed. And the first thing is for, for people to know that we can do this. You know, uh, I didn't quite convince Stephen Chu that we can do this. You know, the, uh, the barrier that, that they're the first is the project-oriented thing, it is, it is going from the scientific perspective, and I'm a physicist, so I, I can honor it, that we want, the scientific perspective is always to take your first step and then take your next step.
But the project perspective would say, what do I want to get, and then can I get there? So uh, the, the, what, we're, what we're doing is we're uh, introducing a, a, a congressional resolution into the House and the Senate. Um, I have potential uh, members of Congress to introduce it. And the, uh, the, uh, the resolution is simply expressing the sense of Congress that the United States is committed to fulfilling the moral imperative of giving ch our children the same climate our parents gave us, a safe and healthy climate. And that's not too radical, right? That, that's the same thing that the conservative climate uh, leadership council is saying. And um, the other thing that we're, that we're working, and, and if you want to work with us, I have a clipboard here, you can join us. It, it, it's sort of indirectly associated with Citizens Climate Lobby. Citizens Climate Lobby is mon monomaniacally focused on the carbon fee and dividend, but we're also committed to leaving our children a healthy climate. And um, the second part we're working on is financing the, the initial R&D. At the moment, globally, we're spending um, a million, maybe two million dollars a year on carbon dioxide removal. Now, the good news is, well, just to get, put it in perspective, at scale, it'll cost about uh, half, you know, half or two thirds of the U.S. military budget each year, over 20 to 50 years, to save the planet. Now, a lot of people say that's too much money. Actually, no one says that's too much money when they think about it. But when we first say it's going to be, you know, upwards, uh, it'll be around, it'll be as somewhere between a half trillion and a trillion and a half dollars a year, a lot of people say, that's too much money, we're not going to do it. When you say, well, in perspective, that's, um, by the time you add technological improvement, that's a, you know, a significant fraction of the U.S. military budget, um, and a small fraction of the global military budget, then a lot of people say, you know what, I'd actually rather spend that money to save the planet for my children and grandchildren than put it into the military. So it's, it's financially practical. Now, we're not, that's not going to happen immediately, but as you know, with any, any technology, like growing technology like solar or wind, it starts small and it grows. At the moment, we're at about a million or two million a year, and we can get philanthropists to, um, get to start seeding that and growing it up so that over a period of 10 years, that's enough time to build a, a campaign that the American public and the global public says, yeah, we really do want to invest a significant amount of money, as much as, well, maybe as much as we spend on the military now, to save the planet for our children. And so, uh, you know, that may be what, you, what we'll be working on starting next year after we get our carbon tax in place. <laughs> Do we have time for questions still? Okay, good. Thank you so much. Thank you.